where we're here with Sherry Mottenstein, who is a therapist, a psychotherapist and an author based in New York. So she's in the epicenter of it all and she knows how all of us are, are feeling or she can understand it, empathize. And so we asked her here because I feel like we all, so many of us need that Kind of support right now. We're we're getting even antsier. We're confused, anxious. I know I am. And Sherry's such a great. She can. You're so empathetic, Sherry, and you know how to really talk to people because you were a journalist before you were a, um, a psychotherapist. And I have to put plug her book because it's so good. It's called How Does That Make You Feel? True Confessions from Both Sides of the Therapy Couch. This is so good. I'm so happy to have this. It's great to Thank see you. what therapists are thinking you know, about us. So anyway, so um, we have quite a few here. So everybody, if you're just joining us, make sure you write any questions you have in the, in the, uh, in the chat and we'll, we'll get them. In the meantime, I'm gonna mute everybody except Sherry and me. And if you wanna put it on, speaker view then you'll you'll get to see sherry but you of course that's up to you um so sherry you should, you should you, because i put on makeup for this so yeah <laughs> so sherry how tell us first you're there in i think you're in long island city correct which is right outside manhattan right right yeah. so yeah. tell us just how you are doing how's your mental state and how are you keeping yourself healthy mentally um, I mean, it's definitely very hard here, um, though we are as, what keeps me sane is Governor Cuomo has these daily briefings and it feels like a ray of sanity in my day. So one of the things that I'm sure we'll be talking about is you need routine and things that help you, that helps me, you know, and we have passed the apex, so that does feel better. I mean, I was also dealing with a medical thing recently, so I'm pretty much just staying in and, you know, I have my puppy, who is always <laughs> great, and my partner is kind of the one who goes out and gets things. So basically, I just feel grateful. Mm -hmm. I'm okay, you know, and I think that's really the helpful thing, like to be grateful for what we do have, but to also allow ourselves to cry, to bitch, moan, whatever, because these are all human emotions. This has this is unprecedented. Mm. I don't think any of us were alive in 1917, the last right. you know the last uh, pandemic. So we're in this limbo state. So and the way that I look at it and what I tell my patients is that this doesn't mean that the problems we had went away. It's just that the enormity of this huge, frightening, life-changing unknown is now on top of that. Mm. So, so we've got an extra level of anxiety on what we all were dealing with before. Absolutely. So yeah. And I think I, I, we had some questions in advance and one of them was my question. So I'm gonna start with mine. We're already getting some questions too that okay. we can get to. But mine is, I feel like I could cry at any moment. I feel like I'm always on the verge of crying, but I don't, I'm not, I have not really cried. And I just think it's weird that I just, I can feel it right there. And I feel like maybe I should watch something really sad, like. Sophie's choice or something just to get it all out. I don't know. So do you <laughs> help? Well, how how are you usually as a as a crier? I, I I do cry pretty much. I'm pretty a pretty good crier, but for some reason I feel it, but I'm not getting it out. And so I just And probably the more you're telling yourself, I feel it, but it's not coming out. Yeah. You know, we can tend to like focus on something and then when we focus on something it it's even harder so yeah i think do that watch a sad movie do like a go to you know what would put on uh, they're awful but those sad animal commercials like for the aspca or something oh. <laughs> <laughs> but also ask yourself what am i holding on to that i'm not letting myself go to that place that's usually a comfort. I know, it's just kind of weird. Does any, I'm gonna put you guys on gallery. Maybe raise your hand if you've been crying 
who's who cry who cry I'm not raising my hand I'm showing who cries regularly and is it is it helpful okay good well and what about people who 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 um anybody un, un, want to cry but hasn't been able to and you know so uh, I I'm not a crier typically but um, and I should also prerequisite this with saying that um, when Sherry was talking about what we're bringing to this crisis, you know, like what was going on before. So I had other things and kind of, this might be more information than people want, but before this crisis really came to a head here in Austin, I was seeking help for some anti-anxiety medication. So that was in place sort of before we came into this and kind of thank God, because this is like a last resort for me. And then here we are in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So I do have a little, I have some chemical help with me, okay? Still, I thank God because, you know, my anxiety level is still woo, you know, but getting back to the crying thing, I um, have been seeing things come through Facebook or Instagram or what have you of um, like world music kind of situations where you start with two people playing an instrument and then it grows and there's a hundred people on the screen and they're and they're all remote they're they're all in their apartments and they're playing in concert together or you know stuff like that and I'm telling you that will just I will lose it because for me, it feels there is something so visceral about being separated and being together. And there's grief and sadness in that for me, but there's also an amazing amount of joy. Mm -hmm. I'm getting verklempt right now, but- Good, good, and, and share, you know? share the verklempness. I just also wanna add though, um, as we all know, this is not therapy. This is kind of like, an emotional support network right now for all of us. Um, and it's okay to be a nervous wreck. It's okay to feel whatever you feel. And a lot of people are having these incredibly intense reactions. Some can cry, some can't, because maybe I think as Jeannie put it before, she's afraid once she starts, the floodgates will open. Um, it's, you kind of have to let yourself realize this is an abnormal time. It's very normal to feel out of control and just what, whatever, I mean, depressed, anxious, stuck in limbo. So this is, we know this is not a substitute for therapy. I really encourage people to reach out. Basically, if like for let's say three or four days, you are just unable to really function, that's a sign that you should reach out. And there are a lot of, certainly therapists such as myself, we're working with people and adjusting finances. That's certainly a big stressor for everybody in addition to everything else. There are also zero cost resources as well. Like New York has an emotional support line that offers free therapy staffed by mental health care volunteers which is 844-863-9314. Vox.com had a great article, When Should You Seek Health, uh, Telehealth, How to Find a Therapist During COVID. Don't, a lot of people still kind of don't want to reach out. Um, there's a stigma or they're afraid to or whatever. We all need help. We all need comfort. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there up front. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. And so I have um, I have it down a stone and I'm going to unmute you because you had a, like a heartbreaking comment situation. And what's your name? I just see. And do you want to put oh, your video on? I don't actually. Okay. okay, that's okay. But can you tell us? You, I mean, it sounds terrible. It's terrible. Um, I have two kids and uh, their father died of COVID. Um, and we're in California, so um, we've been in isolation for a long time. He, um, 
so they weren't able to be with their father, obviously, when he was sick and when he died. And I guess my concern is my daughter's a, a psychologist. She's not working right now, but she's home with three kids, four, six, and eight. So she's having to homeschool two of them. She's with them 24 hours a day. She hasn't been able to grieve because she has to hold it together for her three kids. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, her husband's working full time from home. But, you know, she hasn't been able to be with her brother. She hasn't been able to be, I was divorced from her dad. Um, but any thoughts of what, other than getting in her car and driving somewhere and sobbing, you know, I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts on what could be a safe way for her to grieve and well, not. What, are, what do we mean by a safe? Way. What a space. She has no time. She has okay. no space. Well, and you know, I totally hear that, but it's obviously it's in her and she has to be able to access it and cry and get some of it out. I mean, can she, can she sit in her car? Can she? She cannot because she's got three, she has three kids at home. I mean, she truly cannot yeah okay. so uh she doesn't have that option so and i can't go obviously babysit for her nor right. can any of her neighbors come over and take care of her kids i mean she's had close friends be very kind and receptive and bring over you know drop food and wine okay. and chocolate and all of that but that doesn't do anything for her in terms of being able to process her grief what about even virtually reaching out and you know just she needs texting she does need some way and when the kids are sleeping or can she like go into she the bathroom or do something like that you, you know? can only imagine how exhausted she is right? oh absolutely so yes yeah, she's she's doing this work of saying i don't have time to grieve i don't have time to grieve but she still she needs to try to make some time for at least something that feels somewhat self-nurturing. She is know. exercising. I'll give her, she gets up at five and does the pel pel peladin. Right. So she's physically, she's relieving something doing that. Okay. And she's look, she's a very positive person. Okay. So she's been very much about how this is a real opportunity for her to be home with her children. And it's not that she's not able to experience positive emotions it's more that she can't really let dial, delve into the grief here well, uh, deborah i'm sorry to interrupt i'm just going to add this in that sure. deborah just said it, that in in the notes that when she was grieving for her late place to cry was in the shower right that's mm -hmm. a good one yeah that is good Thank if you. she's ever allowed in the bathroom alone you know it's like I think all of us who've had that, and that is so tough and horrible with you know three kids. I don't know how old they are. I'm gathering not too old. Four, six, and eight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but she, it really is important for her, even at night when she's in bed, um, doing what she needs to do. There are so many also like good books out there. Which yeah, she doesn't have time to read. Trust me. But, and I hear that, but whenever, you know, you're sort of saying for her, she doesn't have time, she doesn't have this, she doesn't have that. And her schedule is just so, so tough. But there can also be, as you said, she's trying to just hold it together. And in that trying to hold it together, there could also be, you know, I mean, I, she's not here. We're not psychoanalyzing her per se, but a reluctance to really even allow herself to start. Well, that's because she knows, I think there is some of that because I think she thinks if she starts, she right. won't be able to pull it back. And her right. kids were very close to him. So uh -huh. they're experiencing their own grief around it. Can she do like, even like a family session with a therapist? Because they're all grieving. Well, the that's interesting. She, they've done ritualistic things as a family because she's very sophisticated psychologically, obviously, because she's a psychologist. Right. So she does, you know. But she, you can't do it for yourself. No, you cannot. But yeah. she's done processes for her kids. 
Well, I don't think that maybe she's the best person to be doing this for her kids and herself and all of that because she's going through this grief herself. I'm just, you know, wondering That's a good point. if maybe she could reach out to someone else, a therapist, um, who can do like a therapy session alone with her, with the family, with the kids, with them individually. I think she needs some real outside help there. Because, That's a good idea. I like that. Yeah, because a part of it is also the resistance to, I don't want to let myself even start going there because right. I won't stop. And that's, you know, you're feeling it for her. We can imagine what it's like for her, but they're all grieving. Right. And then for her to try to be this, the strength, not just for herself, but all three kids, that she's mm -hmm. going to break herself. And the kids, need, they all need the outside help. They all need it. Okay, that's good. But thank good. God for the internet. I mean, let her get somebody to yeah. them okay. all. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, and we've had some other people suggest journaling, and maybe her husband can give give her some time away uh, just to, for your for your daughter. So there's there's suggestions being made here. And before we go any farther, I wanted to ask you again, Sherry, what's that phone number for the um, New York one. Um, yes. This is New York's emotional support line. And you know, if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, okay. It's 844-863-9314. Okay. There's okay. also a crisis text line. Uh, you can text crisis, C-R-I-S-I-S, -S, all um, uppercase, to okay. seven. 41741 for free confidential crisis counseling. There's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1 800 273 8255. I also want to mention again, uh, I mentioned this at the beginning, I don't know how many people were here yet. Vox.com published a really good article called Telehealth how to find a therapist during COVID-19. And I put that in the chat. Oh, great, okay. To yeah. Copy and paste that if, if, you, if, that, if you can do that. So um, let me ask, see if, if people are having, if anybody wants to raise their hand, I have a gap, it's a, you have something you wanna say, or I'm gonna pass on some more questions I got beforehand. Anybody wanna to, to be part, to ask something right now? Well, I'm gonna ask then a question that came up. Um, I guess I've heard it from several people, but it was the idea that you hear people saying, oh, I'm getting so much done. I, I'm getting reading done. I'm getting you know, my gardening done and organizing my house. But a, a lot, several people I've talked to have said, I can't even concentrate 15 minutes on reading. I can't get anything done. And it, I think the idea that there are people out there getting things done makes, others feel worse you know some people who are really stuck right so how what would you say to these people well you know there's that whole FOMO thing we always think everybody else is doing so much more than we are and Facebook is great in connecting all of us but people only put often their best self up there oh look I wrote war and peace in the last two weeks and no everybody is going through their own thing and the comparison game oh everybody else does this is always a really bad place to go mm -hmm. so i think the thing is to a it's don't have huge expectations of yourself like don't say oh my god if i don't you know knit an entire sweater today or whatever but just try to set very small goals, something that feels achievable, you know, because routine and goal setting are really good things to do. So people are still there, they're in shock. I mean, this is not what we know of. This is some alternate, you know, Groundhog Day universe. So we do have to have a routine, set schedule, set a schedule, 
don't compare yourself to other people um, because believe me, maybe people have different coping mechanisms. Some people, I know I've always been that way where I leap to working, you know, but that's not necessarily always the best thing to do anyway, because it doesn't mean that these huge feelings that you're having are not there. They're just closeted, you know, so people have different coping mechanisms with that. So just try to breathe with it, get in tune with yourself, set small goals. If you do more, great. Say, I'm going to read four pages. If you read five, excellent. You know, whatever. It's okay. It's okay. How many, you can just raise your hand. How many people have felt that they should be using their time better or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, does, and does anybody but want to talk about that? Raise your hand again if you want to talk about that, that pressure you might feel. Is it, okay, Amy, I mean, Jamie, unmuting. Wait, hold on one second, we'll unmute. Can you, oh, there you go, there you go. I, I, um, so I feel all of those things and um, it's been going on for a while, even before COVID-19 for me. And, um, I, I don't, this sort of works in concert for me and I'm not sure if anybody else feels the same way. So, so I, I, I don't really have a schedule. I do understand the, the small goals. I'm going to clean the cooktop of my stove today and that's it. You know, like really tiny things. I'm going to unload the dishwasher, you know, woo. Um, and it sounds so silly, but I allow myself that. But here's my question that, let's say that, that okay, I'm past the, I'm not gonna write war and peace. I'm not gonna, you know, knit that sweater. But then what happens if the pendulum is like swinging all the way in the other direction and I'm, you know, eating s'mores for dinner and, um, um, just allowing myself to like sleep in till 10 o'clock because you know like so now things are like how concerned about that should I be because I know I'm kind of setting myself up for a big shock right when things go back to normal but I can't seem to stop it's sort of like I'm allowing myself all these bad be not bad behaviors but justifiable emotional responses but they're not, these are not, they're, they're, they're understandable. Not Let's say the word they're understandable, but they're not helpful. And the key word is that you're also, you're realizing you're saying, I am allowing myself. That's really what it is. And, you know, and I'm saying be gentle with yourself. Yes, but that doesn't mean just let yourself be a rag doll and put the covers over your head and do nothing. And that's why I think part of that is that you stick to a schedule. You get up every morning, you take a shower, eating and sleeping well are really important. Set a schedule and have that routine. Sometimes the way that I tell people to, you know, do things is it's kind of like you're building up a muscle. Like I... I kind of, I liken it to, and I know this was the same for me. I mean, I would go to the gym in my building pretty much every day before this started. But in the beginning, it was kind of like, oh, uh, you know, because I, I, I knew I wanted to go to the 6.30 class a.m. And then, you know, the alarm would go off at 6.20 and I'd be like, am I insane? But, you know, then I just did it. It's kind of like when you make yourself do it, you're building that muscle. And then you just keep saying, I'm gonna do this. And then kind of make yourself do it. Because overall, you, you don't wanna feel like you're occupied 20 more for seven, but you really need for your health, for your emotional and physical health, to make sure that you are doing things that are okay for you. And some of the things that you're talking about, like, you know, eating s'mores for dinner or whatever, and those things, I would like look at, where am I? 
is this because you know there sounds like there's some depression going on there's things like that it's i think you just need to take to check in with yourself and say wait what's going on here you know um i kind of think i need to look into what i'm doing push myself reach out you know because that's one of the most helpful things reach out and um i do tell people to journaling is a great thing i think other things that help us too is to help other people that always makes us feel good to find five things to be grateful about every day it can be small it doesn't matter but what we tell ourselves is hugely important like uh if we eat junk food like s'mores all day you know our body's going to suffer if we have junk thoughts um our mind our psyche is going to suffer so i think also if you're having trouble making yourself do something then you know as i said just do it because all the worry and the resistance that we give ourselves it takes a lot more energy than just doing the thing and then congratulate yourself and say yay yay me you know i think it's really good to congratulate ourselves and um not just think when we finally do something which a lot of us tend to do eh no big deal cuz you did it you know we we often just don't appreciate ourselves we beat up on ourselves while we're out there being supportive to other people so i would say look at some of those behaviors as okay this isn't good i have to stop i don't want to allow myself anymore I have to do something. I have to stop allowing myself. And we also have Kim Barr. You had said you. I think you had something you wanted to say about this, Kim. Oh, wait, are you there? You had your hand up. I didn't know if you wanted to say something. Okay, I can't hear you. Ow. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Kim. I couldn't hear you. But also, um, Barbara. You had something to talk about related to this, about your um, <coughs> skills. Barbara? Hello, Barbara. Okay. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> People, I'm unmuting you, but I don't know. And so, and also, uh, Deborah, did you, you wrote something. Wait, I'm unmuting you. But it's not unmuting. Hold on. Can you can you unmute there? There, Deborah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay. in, <laughs> in speaking about those times when you just want to feel like junk, I've had three weeks, three good weeks where I've kept a work schedule. I've helped someone. I had to recently go through surgery, which is rough during this time oh, anyway. Yes. But after that, I've allowed my three days of no exercise, stay in bed, eat as much junk as I want to eat. And I did have brownies for breakfast one morning and ice cream for lunch one day. Everything is that, balanced. Sure. That is not normally me. Yeah. But I've allowed myself. And today I got up feeling that oh, I don't like myself doing that. So I got back in. It, it almost with over going or going over the one way so far, it has thrown me back into a normal path. Mm. And I think every now and then, um, we're also tough on ourselves that we don't allow ourselves those down times. And maybe if we just took a, a day or so to have those down times, we'd all be a little better for us, for everybody else. And I did this this morning, I woke up and, watched the last three hours of the Mad Men series. I mean, you know, the last three of the whole, that I finally got to watch and I've been watching it. So I just sat there and I haven't done that in ages, but I, 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 told, I said to myself, I am so happy. <laughs> so That's great. That's great. And yeah, you know, we like a couple mornings ago, you know, we had started watching Unorthodox on Netflix. And then, you know, it was like, you know, Monday morning, last Monday morning or something. I just said, 
let's stay in bed and finish it. And it was just this libidinous pleasure. This was like, yay. It's nice. You have to allow yourself that. Okay. So yeah, I think in a lot of us are tend to feel guilty about those kind of things. So I think that with all that's going on, we don't need guilt, right? We don't need guilt. (laughs) And that's, you know, and as we, uh, as I, we said at the outset, this pandemic is on top of all of our stuff that we already had. So you already had a poo-poo platter of anxiety, negative thought chain, guilt, you know, all those things. So now this, this period in our lives, which will end, it's a limbo, which makes it harder, um, but it will end. It's also a really good opportunity because we're kind of really stuck with ourselves. You know, normally what we do, like I have patients who literally hop on a plane and go to the ends of the earth, you know, anything to avoid just sitting with themselves. And all of a sudden, we kind of don't have a choice. So it's also an opportunity to reflect. I often say what's often harder is um, we, we don't want to feel those uncomfortable feelings. You know, we're kind of used to the comfortable discomfort of dealing with, we cope the way we cope, but we hate ourselves. But we're just used to it. It's like that low hum or whatever it is. But this is an opportunity to just let yourself breathe with it and sit for a limited amount of time with some of those feelings that we're always running from. Because when we don't allow ourselves to ever feel the feelings, they take over. They rule us. But if we just say, okay, and then go on and, you know, go back into the moment, into our day, gradually, those feelings are not ruling us anymore. They're there, but we're starting to take charge of our life in a more positive way. Yeah, I like that idea of feeling, being with yourself and your emotions, because we don't, and, and normally, and I think that's really hard. That's probably adding stress on everything. It's just like, okay, like, ah, like sometimes I look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, oh, you again, you know, <laughs> But um, we have a point from, I think that some people in the, in the comments or we're chat, we're talking about um, what's normal. Um, you know, it's, I think the uncertainty part of it, like, it's just, it's so, that is so hard. I mean, uncertainty, it's just in any case, but this idea of, can we go back to normal? When is anything yeah. going to be again? And that uncertainty, oh what can we do about uncertainty? It's just... And, you know, anxiety is all about worrying about the future. It's like depression is about the past. Mm. Anxiety is about worrying about the future. And the uncertainty, this is something we, the only thing that we have control, the only thing that we really have control over are our actions and reactions. That's it. Like the only thing that we really have control over is doing what we're, what we should be doing to take care of of ourselves and others around us. That's it. In terms of the rest of it, it really is about, like we just mentioned the word challenges before, how do I, it's an opportunity because we don't know what's gonna happen next week, next month, how long this is gonna last. It will end, but we can't battle and wrestle uncertainty into a box and throw it down the incinerator. It's there. So it's more about asking ourselves, how can I start coexisting better with the universal uncertainty that we are living under right now? You know, because that, that's really more what it is. Whenever we think, I just don't want to feel that thing. Uh-uh. It's, it's there. It's just about... I do tell people though, because a lot of people are like addicted to the news and this and that. And I think it's really probably helpful to like limit your viewing time. Like I, in the beginning, 
I was just, you know, glued. And I, I really was a f impacting me in a negative way on top of personal stuff that was also happening. So now I just, I limit myself, you know, to there's, you know, one or two things that I'll watch about it during the day. And, you know, that's it. You know, I'm always, I always want to know whenever I see there's an update on vaccine or treatment or whatever, I'm like, well, you know, uh, but it really is about what can I do in this moment to appreciate what there is in this moment and what I can learn that will help me with the rest of my life and help me grow. One of my favorite books that has gotten me through a lot in my life is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for uh, Me. Yes. Oh. I cannot recommend that book enough. And my parents were Holocaust survivors, and Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. Oh, yes. I'm putting that down. Um, I remember somebody had me read that, and that, that helped a lot. That helped me a lot during different times. I wanted to ca um, call on Michelle Meyer. And Michelle, for some reason, can you unmute yourself? For some reason, my op, op there. Yes. I'm but, unmuted. Yes. Okay. So you had a couple things you were talking about. You had anger with the news, which I hear, and then also how to deal with the negative thoughts. So you want to talk to her? You want to ask? Yeah. Questions? Is there one you want me to address? No, 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 the, the, the negative thoughts. I think that's a good one. Yeah. Um, and that's, and especially if you're already someone like so many of us, who is living in that negative thought chain, this can totally make it worse. Um, and it's good to, you know, one exercise that I often tell patients to do, um, cause I say how many times a day, usually I say this at the intake, like how often every day are you putting yourself down or having, you know, a real pessimistic thought about something or whatever. And, you know, because I, and they're like, oh, I don't know, but a lot, you know. So then I'll say for one day, don't, you don't have to write down what the thoughts are, but just jot down how often, because then you come back and you see, oh my God, 500 negative thoughts in a day. No wonder I'm doing this. So it really is about some of the, it, it's about, you first have to notice how badly you're beating yourself up, you know? And then, I mean, there are, and, and again, if people, therapy is a helpful thing for some people, meds, I'm not saying go right out and get meds or go right out and do whatever, but it is about, we have to start training ourselves though, in some ways, like, cause we all, we have like monkey mind, you know, which is like a meditation term, obviously that you're trying to just focus or breathe and your mind's going everywhere, but you kind of have to lasso it. And some things I tell people to do is put on a rubber band and when you find yourself having a negative thought, snap it, you know, and then shift it around in your head and, you know, make it, you know, turn it into a positive thing. And that's why, you know, um, I was saying some things earlier, like um, write down every day things to be grateful for. Some things that I've had people do um, is because when I ask people how they see themselves, usually it's this tor often it's this tortured anguish, you know, soliloquy. And I kind of tell them about an exercise that I did years ago at um, Omega Upstate, which is like kind of a new, a new age kind of retreat that has workshops. And we were, I was in a, a circle with a lot of people. We, none of us had ever met, but we, talked and then one by one the person who was leading it um, had us one by one turn around like with a notepad while everybody else said things about us that they'd noticed like and somebody said oh sherry has a great laugh or sherry this or sherry that and i was like oh my god i never saw any of that and i kept that for years you mm -hmm. know um often just i've told people like email friends, people who, you know, care about you and just say, you yeah, know, my therapist made me do this, but, you know, tell me things about myself that you like or that you appreciate. You know, I mean, I, when I ask people, um, what are your strengths and things you like about yourself? Often they're like, you know, but if, if we, they can talk about the stuff that they 
hate about themselves or don't like, they can go on ad infinitum. You know, so it's kind of about what I often say is it's like you're just staring at one space and that's it, you know, but if you let yourself lift your eyes, you'll see a whole room. There are other ways to go. And it's about gradually letting yourself kind of go to those positive places. And, you know, for people who really have really bad self-esteem, constantly self-attacking, I mean, that is something that, you know, certainly therapy is a very helpful thing with, but it really is about at least start catching it, you know, and um, start telling yourself, what are my strengths? What do I like about yourself? Positive things. Like we were talking earlier, congratulate yourself for doing things. Like I am the biggest techno bad person in the world. So it's like, you know, I can change a, a light bulb at eye level, you know? So if I do something, you know, that for me is like for, you know, other people, it might be, oh, but for me, it's like, yay, look, I did this. And we have to start treating ourselves the way we treat everybody else. Yes. You know, like another thing, and then I'll, I'll stop, um, is to sometimes like write a letter like you would write to somebody else about all the things that you love and notice about them you know, like your best friend or whoever, you know, and then what would you ever write something like that to yourself? No, because you're so busy beating yourself up. That's, that's great. Um, um, I have a question. Yeah, who's, uh, who's speaking? Michelle. Oh, okay. Yes, Michelle. Um, I, my physical therapist told me to look in the mirror and tell myself I'm beautiful. Um, I feel stupid doing that. You know, it, it just feeling feel stupid, so feeling weird, feeling whatever. So what? It's a new thing. So just take a breath and, you know, it's the judgment it. stuff. Just yeah. say it? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Give it a shot. Okay. <laughs> And Joanna, I, I want to unmute you because um, you had a point uh, that you wanted to discuss. Oh wait, did I unmute or am I? You yeah, no, you're 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 you me? vocal okay. now. We hear uh, you about, about how I brought up um, the issue I had yesterday. Um, I have a really great relationship with my husband. We're now together twenty four seven. Uh, we're going on thirty five years of marriage, so it's been a long, good relationship, but. Yesterday, he was exhausted the entire day, like really, really exhausted, which I would think that you would just say, okay, this is a day he needs to collapse. This is a day he's getting himself back. But instead, I had a different reaction, which was I was panicked, panicked. I was literally looking at him every minute of the day. I was actually at some point even trying to get him not to be exhausted. You know, well, you should get up and you can do this instead. It's really weird, you know, that boundary of letting a person have their own mm. way of reacting to whatever he went through. I found that I kind of went over my boundary um, because, and sometimes I was even lashing out. I was so scared. I, I mentioned earlier that I cry, but I don't cry too easily. I have cried during this period, but not where it isn't really hard. But I had a feeling inside me was tremendous fear and grief. I'm seeing so much loss around me. There's so many people losing loved ones or losing their freedom or losing their money, whatever it is. Some of it, you know, is in our case too. Um, but some of it is just about my loved ones. So when I saw him trying to just stay awake and wasn't able to for most of the day and night, when we had planned things that would have made me calmer, I didn't handle it well. And I wanted to, Bring that up for you what is it like when you're very close to someone love them dearly but you know when their moment comes like that yeah i didn't respect it i was more about myself and what it brought up in me which i'm not thrilled about but that's what but happened. you know you did so it's kind of like okay i went there what can i learn from it and you know see from that and you know they're there's almost like, it sounds like, as you were saying, it's like this visceral panic 
PTSD thing, like, oh my God, you know, what mm -hmm. would happen if, and all of that. And you just reacted from that total fear place. So, you know, I'm sure like later you said to him, I'm sorry. You know, he fell, he fell asleep, so it was the morning. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> well, but that's still, and that's okay. But it's kind of like noticing, it's kind of more for you about you right now. Like, what can you do to help yourself? Right. And I, and I found myself on I'm such a, a high level of sustained anxiety for such a long time now. Mm -hmm. You know, so it sounds like you need to help you. Because we can't help somebody else if we're not okay. You know? So what do you need? Right. I, I, that's a really great point and a really great focus. And I think I was so afraid of it. Of it may be, maybe this was going to be my loss. Maybe he was actually going through something and I was worried I might lose him. So I completely projected and panicked. Um, and this morning I took care of myself. I worked out for two hours to calm down and then we're fine. He's fine today. He slept, he did what he had to do, but you're right. You know, at the moment I should have taken care of myself and let him do his thing. I was more micromanaging, making sure he was not going to float away. Yeah. You were trying to, and then, yeah, that anxiety is all about, I need to control whatever because then I'll feel okay. But you know, it's it's just that kind of visceral, you know. Or if, or or if only we're both together in this pandemic, supporting each other, right. it's safer. But if you're needing sleep, which is valid, and I'm alone, how am I going to cope? I mean, that was part of it too, and you know, and, and I'm realizing that now. Yeah. And just, people are dealing, you know, being together. I mean, some of us are going through it alone, but some of us are with a spouse or with children who've come home or children who are already there. But that in and of itself is the, the tensions that can come from that, right? The, who's experiencing that? Olga, I think, wants to speak. Olga, can you unmute? Oh, oh. Okay, Olga. Olga, I, don't, I can't hear you, but you're not, I unmuted you. Can anyone hear her? No. You're unmuted, but. Oh, I just thought I heard like a faint. What? <laughs> <Faint> something. <laughs> we're gonna, can you try again? No, we're going to come back to you, okay. Olga. And I think Michelle Meyer was saying that she too is petrified. Her husband's older and she's very petri she's petrified of losing him anytime she, she goes there. So, um, but I think that whole, the whole re relationship thing is to have, be together. There's going to, I mean, even Marcelina, you were talking about that. You have such a solid 33 year marriage, but it's like 24 seven, we're not made for this. It's very <laughs> difficult. It's incredibly challenging and it's, there's a lot of strain because you may love your spouse, but usually you're not always together. This is an enforced togetherness and you're already stressed for yourself. And often what we do is um, sometimes, you know, we take out on somebody we know we can take stuff out on because they're not going anywhere now, really, literally, you know, <laughs> that's, that's ultimately not going to be helpful for um, either, you know, either of you. So I think it's, it's kind of about, um, you know, and, and they're also, as we, we've all heard, certainly this enforced togetherness, the domestic abuse rate has been, it, that's on the rise. And um, in China, there was an increase in divorce filings once they were allowed to like go on the street again. I mean, it, it's real. So, this is an opportunity to practice good relationship skills as well. Like I do couples therapy, um, express appreciation for small things that they do. Um, I often say also like, you know, with those impulsive feelings that well up, it's about, it's kind of like the tea kettle is boiling and 
you kind of have to catch it before it's like right on the brink because the sooner you catch the feelings, the sooner you can work on it. Like I always say to people, what does it feel like? How does it manifest physically? Is it in your stomach? Is it a red hot poker? This, that, whatever. The more you really notice what you're feeling, it's better. Cause we just say it comes over me and I just can't do a thing. And then it's kind of gradually, if you can get to the point where you take a three second pause before you say the thing and say, what's going to happen if I say this thing or do this thing, you know, um, how are you going to feel after? Um, and do things like, it, cause it's so easy to get people who have a lot of, who have bad patterns together. And you know, that's going to be all of us, even in good relationships, we don't want to accentuate that or let that run free. So maybe if you can start noticing, I'm really in a pissy mood. I don't want to take it out on you. Why don't you go into the other room or start? I mean, I think that we have to start practicing relationship skills that maybe we're a little rusty at, or we haven't been doing. It's even more important now. Yeah. And let's, let's see, Olga, we're going to try you again. Ah! <laughs> oh, I feel bad. Yeah. Um, and Marcelina had a dear, and uh, I'm sorry, Olga. It's just not, it's not working. Um, Marcelina, you had something else that you saw that you wanted to talk about or you feel. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, so my point was, wh what do you do with those feelings of resentment when you see uh, people like on Facebook, this is a particular a family member. Oh, it's cool. always flaunting. Family, yes, yeah. Like, you know, having people over for wine. And it's like, what the hell? You know, we're, we're not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. And even though she's sitting outside and they look like they're six feet apart, it just bugs the hell out of me that she's doing that. And it's like, I don't want to be the COVID police. I'm not going to say anything. Right. But it's hard to not resent that when you see people kind of flaunting or flouting the rules and getting away with it. And it just, ah, you know, it's just, it's, an, it's more of an irritant than a big problem. But right. in my neighborhood, and I mean, I live in a very small town and next door is a big thing here. So you see a lot of that kind of bitchy uh, policing happening. People complaining about children on bicycles. And, and it's like, it, it's just, it's really bringing out this like bitchiness in people. And, and, right. uh, <laughs> Because we're all, like, it's one thing if we're all in this together, if we're all really in this together, we're all following the same rules, you can kind of, like, cope with it better. But if you feel like people are getting away with, like, not doing what they're supposed to be doing, it just makes it harder on everybody, you know? And, so, you know, again, absolutely. And you can want to wring somebody's neck, like, what the hell are you doing, you know? But again, the only things we could control are yeah. our actions and reactions. I know that. I know. And we, we can know something intellectually that's yeah. not the same thing as here. So maybe don't look at that person's posts. You know, why irritate yourself unnecessarily? You have enough going on now as right. it is. And these things are all the underneath of this is be scared. We're all scared. You know, people would take their temperature like, you know, 12 times a day. Everybody is scared. So that's going to trigger. It's not just how can that person do that thing. It's triggering your fear, your anxiety, your stuff. So the more you can kind of recognize that and just take care of yourself as best as possible and, you know, sort of try like i stopped watching too much of the news because it was just making me too upset you know um like and so i think it's kind of the same pot the same principle um especially family members nobody can push our buttons like family yeah. you know? <laughs> that's, true. that's you know the yeah. biggest truth i will say today so maybe just don't you know yeah don't watch it. And that's the, the worry I have is that kind of thing is going to get worse because people are starting, as we know, people are starting to break out, trying to like, yeah. they're taking at all the rules and they're going to they do protest in any, some form. I've just been hearing it all around that like even, you know, kids are out on streets now playing soccer together, you know, it just, it's because they, it just can't be contained. So I think we're going to, each have those kind of feelings more absolutely yeah 
um, and see, New Cleveland. Let, let me unmute you and tell me your name. <laughs> Hi, this is Karen. Hi, Karen. Uh, yes, and this is the, the lovely Karen who runs the uh, NewClevelandRadio.net, and I do my my Sherapy podcast. I was say, I've got to put that down. I've got to, everybody, you got to listen to that. I'll put the, the link in, or maybe, uh, maybe you can, Karen. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, I'm doing I'm doing my next podcast. I haven't done it for a while, but I'm I'm doing my next podcast this Tuesday. So then I'll post it, and Karen will post it. And basically, Sherpy is where it's a, a therapy session, an actual individual therapy session with somebody. They are anonymous, and I change private details before we do it. I do like a big intake with them the way I do with a patient who's going to be coming with me. And it's, it's a, it's a therapy session. So that's what therapy is. So Karen, sorry, go ahead. What would oh, you want to say? Well, the only thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, I too don't like the people who are breaking the rules, but my feeling finally is if they want to break the rules, then they will have to pay the consequences. Now I'm going to stay at home. I'm going to wear my face mask. I'm gonna wear rubber gloves when I go out and I'm gonna to try to stay as healthy as I can. I can't control anybody else, um, but those people are gonna make it a longer stay at home for the rest of us. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I think we might, let's try Olga again. She's on the different. Um... Good, well, we're gonna get Olga in. Okay. Hey, okay. Hey, I, I'm connected to my mobile. I don't know if you know this computer, so it's two of me now. So, hi, everybody. I just wanted to interesting you told about relationships. And I am actually having the same relationship. Olga, Olga click off the computer and just use the phone. Okay. Um, so, basically, I'm having the same connection with my husband as before, which is really funny. We're here, but I don't think we see each other more often. He's always in the office from the morning to evening. Oh, that's a good point. Okay. Then, I mean, it's like evening and we meet and once in a while I say hi and I'm like, this is bizarre. I, it's almost like he's gone for work all the time. I have like this is in the beginning I was so upset about it and then I said what's bad about it nothing so I just kind of let it go and said okay that's what it is then well another thing is maybe have a conversation with him about it you know because for a lot of us it's kind of comforting and you know we said before doing your routine keeping on schedule and all those things it's a really good thing to do in this time, but this can also be an opportunity for the two of you watch a movie together. I mean, have a conversation with him about, you know, kind of what you're noticing and how you feel, and maybe it would be nice to set some time together. I'll try, but it's almost like, like he's gone for work and then he's coming back and he comes for lunch i'm doing all these amazing lunches and then it's gone and i'm like very strange but we'll see i mean nothing bad happening so i'm like all right it's good but, but you're here and you're mentioning it so yeah. there is yeah. something that you are feeling about that because you're here mentioning it right. you know so you you'd like more time you yeah with it with it yeah because you're lonely, and surely a lot of us are. Yeah, that's the point. Like, we're together in the same space, but we are not really. But emotionally, and yeah, not. Emotionally we are not. As you want. What yeah. are many people having the same, like, you know, just being physically in the same spot, it's probably will show you a lot of different angles of how you connect it. And um, that's very interesting. How do you usually, I mean, in the olden days, you know, um, BP, before the pandemic, I mean, how was it? How, how much? Yeah, it's pretty much similar. I mean, when I was in the city, I'm in my state. I'm doing a lot of other things, talking to people. Then he comes, says hello, and we, I mean, 
on the weekends we might do something with friends. Okay. Which now is not happening. And um, we didn't go out a lot lately. He doesn't like to do it. I used to do it with friends. And, but, and I thought it's going to change when we are home. But no, it didn't. It's almost the same. Which People is, are who they are. Uh, right. You get into patterns. And the two of you are like in this pattern. You know, right. so just right now, it sounds like he's just kind of keeping on, keeping on with the way it was before. Like, um, well, some of the and you, things that I do when I work with couples is about, you know, kind of helping each person really hear each other and listen and have empathy and understand where the other one is coming from and <laughs> be able to say what you need and what you would like. And, you know, it just sounds like it might be because you're, you're kind of thinking to yourself, though, just assuming, well, you know, we're just sort of doing what we were doing, but maybe, you know, kind of would be nice, you know, but you're just kind of in this place, it sounds like, of just assuming, well, I guess we're just carrying on the way we were. But what's going on for him? What's he feeling? Yeah, I mean, it's a thought to talk. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's a talk if that needs to happen, or yeah, because I, I kind of had the other problem with a husband who's always <laughs> not used to 